All right. Well, I am excited to get the week started in earnest. Now, uh, before we begin, let me just remind you that I've got a new website up. If you're interested in sharing this book with someone, maybe recommending it to somebody to, to purchase, uh, you can do that on my website. This this link here, um, this button links to my eBay page. Uh, that's the easiest way for most people. They could also email me as well, and there's a way to do that here. It also has my contact information as far as my P.O. box uh, for people that want to pay in precious metals. I got this in the mail yesterday, which is, as far as I know, the last person that has agreed to pay in silver. Uh, he got three books in exchange for this amazing silver Britannia, which I love these Britannias. I've got a couple of gold ones as well. Um, but yeah, this is an ounce of silver from uh, the UK. And uh, in the back, it's got the queen, which a lot of coins for some reason have the queen on the back. But uh, I don't really care so much about that, but I do like having silver. Um, also, if you are interested in uh, supporting me on Patreon, at the $15 level, I'll also be sending you a book uh, to have. So uh, all the patrons um, have been asking, when am I going to be sending those books out? I will be sending those books by the end of the month uh, to everybody who, who wanted one. So, uh, yeah, you can check this out, uh, my new website. It's really mostly a landing page, but it does have a little bit of information and links to my content and all of that kind of thing. Now, let's jump into the topic today. My goodness gracious. So um, I, I wasn't going to talk about uh, Gospel Coalition Canada's ridiculous positions anymore, Um but I, I saw this, this uh, I guess it's a tweet from Tim Stevens. Um, someone shared it on Gab, and I just decided to do it because I just, I just want to really highlight just the, the, the dishonesty and the cowardice and just the general you know, behavior of so much of, uh, of Gospel Coalition and Gospel Coalition associated people. Um, and I can connect this to what's going on in the SBC as well, and I'm, I'm intending to do that. But, but here's a, uh, a tweet from Tim Stevens, and he says this. He says, I just got a tip that the police may be on their way to arrest me. Why? I continue to lead our church to worship Jesus as Lord over every earthly power. More to come. Pray, brothers and sisters, stand firm, keep the faith. So this is a pastor in Canada who was arrested, and I, I think he was arrested once before, or maybe he's just a new pastor who's being arrested, and his big crime is that he refuses to shut down his church, and he continues to preach Christ on Sunday to his congregation. He continues to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs on the Lord's Day. He continues to serve the elements uh, to his congregation on Sundays, and he continues to greet each other with a holy kiss on Sundays. He refuses to accept that the civil governing authority has the authority to close down church because someone might get the sniffles. So that's a very radical, uh, outrageous claim, I know, especially when you worship the state. That's an outrageous claim. But, uh, you know, he's not willing to say we have no king but Caesar. Absolutely not. We have a king, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. We do what he says, not what you say. Pretty simple, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not complicated stuff. You know, at the beginning of all this craziness, I remember, you know, uh, the the cross politic guys had Jonathan Lehman on their show, and uh, Jonathan Lehman was presenting this this ridiculous position where it's like, oh, we got to build the cultural capital, and uh, and and Chocolate Knox at one point says, yeah, but you know, if there was something worth fighting for, you would think it'd be worship on Sunday. Right, like worship on Sunday is not a small little thing; it's a major thing. And and I think what we've betrayed about our beliefs on Sunday is that really, you know, we might talk a big game, we might buy the nine marks books and talk about how important the gathering of the saints is and stuff like that, but we really don't believe it. I mean, if we can go weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and not really feel any different not going to church on Sunday then we, we really don't believe it. We can speak it with our mouths, but we don't believe it. I mean, what James says is, you say you have faith, show me your faith by your works. I've got works. I can, I, I, you, when, when you see how I act, what I do, it proves that I believe what I say I believe. When you act and, and, when you act and you don't do the things that you say you believe, then how, why should I believe you? You know what I mean? So let's, um, 
the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because Paul Carter, a uh, Canadian pastor who a lot of people, you know, after I did my first video on Paul Carter, a lot of people reached out to me and said, hey, AD, you know, he's a good guy. He's a really conservative guy. And um, that may be, you know what I mean? That may be. But I- I'm just judging these articles on their own merit. And I have to say that this is, um, I'm trying to be nice today. <laughs> this is, it's hard to imagine putting yourself in the mindset, in, in the mental place that Paul Carter must have been when he wrote this article. This article does not name the pastors who have been arrested. This article does not even address it. It's, it's as if it didn't happen. The first article didn't really address it either. Now, this one addresses it slightly more, but still does not use any names, doesn't go into any detail. And the whole point of this article is that, sure, you know, pastors are being arrested, but, you know, it's not real persecution. Here's 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 the uh, the key the key paragraph here. And I encourage you to read this all this all uh, this whole article because it's all a bunch of nonsense. So let's um Let's see if I can find it here. Hold on. Here, here's, here's, here's what I'm talking about. He says, As I write this, a number of churches in Canada are wrestling with the question of how they should understand the challenges we currently face with respect to the health and safety protocols enacted by the government in the battle against COVID-19. Does this qualify as persecution? When the government says that you can only allow 100 people in your sanctuary that can normally seat 650, that can certainly feel like persecution. It will undoubtedly be difficult. That is the reality I'm facing here for the next two to three months. May his church shrink to zero. Sorry, that wasn't in the article. That will mean waking up at four in the morning to run multiple services inside and outside, morning and evening, to serve our entire congregation. That is going to be difficult. It is going to be borderline exhausting, but I have a hard time thinking that of that as persecution. Brothers and sisters in North Korea are meeting in groups of four to five in basements and root cellars, whispering hymns in the dark, knowing full well that if they get caught, they will be executed or sent to internment camps. That is persecution. What we're experiencing here in Ontario and throughout most of the provinces in Canada is inconvenient and exhausting, but it doesn't feel to me like persecution, and I don't think it would be helpful for our people if I, call, if it, if I called it that. And so his point is that it's not as bad as it is in North Korea, and it's not as bad as it's been in the past, therefore it's not persecution. The idea being, and, and again, he, he basically ignores the arrests, right? He says, well, you know, they're just telling you you can't have that many people in your church. Um, so that's not persecution. You know, they, they're, just, they're just making life more difficult for you. That's not persecution. But of course, he ignores the people that have not obeyed that and, and have been arrested. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of an irrelevant article, but it's also a very devious, sneaky article, um, because to write an article about the, what's going on in Canada and to ignore those who have been arrested, I think, um, you know, you have to understand that to be a very strategic thing. And I think I know why he does it, because in the scripture, it talks about arrests as persecution, and obviously so. I mean, you know, if, if, if you think that the only thing that qualifies as persecution is if they kill you, um, which at, 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 there's an article here that kind of tries to make that case. Let me see if I can find it here. Here's an article Paul wrote a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago. He says, when they are arresting your pastor and chopping him into little bits and throwing him into Lake Ontario, it is time to take shelter into a barn. And he says, that's persecution. So in Paul's mind, that unless they're killing you or cutting off your limbs and arms and throwing you into a river uh, or a lake, rather, then, then it's not persecution, which is a stupid position, and it's not biblical. So I think what happens here is that Paul ignores the arrests because he knows that the Bible speaks of arrests as persecution. Here's, um, here's Acts chapter 5. Um, after, the, after the apostles had been uh, arrested and they were beaten, um, they departed from the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they certainly didn't see that. I think, I think every pastor would agree that when they were arrested, that that was persecution. Although this doesn't actually use the word persecution, but the book of Acts does use that word. This is Acts chapter 9, and this is when uh, the apostle Paul is converted. So he's Saul, and then he becomes Paul. And if you remember, uh, a bright light was, was shown all around him. He went blind. He falls to the ground, and he hears the Lord. He hears Christ say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So this is a good passage because it says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul responds, and he says, who are you, Lord? 
and, 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 and Christ says to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So Jesus uses the word persecuting. Now, we understand as we read this that uh, Jesus is talking about Paul, uh, Saul rather, persecuting his body. He's persecuting the apostles. So he was, uh, what was he doing? So let's go back into chapter 8 to find out what was Paul doing that Jesus himself describes as persecution. So here is what had happened. If you remember, uh, Stephen, he was a deacon, he gets, uh, he gets stoned to death because they say he committed blasphemy. Now, of course, he did not commit blasphemy. He, he went, he, but this guy knew the New Old Testament better than probably they did. He goes through the, you remember, he goes through the whole presentation, the whole sermon from, from Genesis all the way to the end of the Old Testament, talking about how Christ is Lord, right? And then they get all pissed off because he accuses them of, of killing uh, the Lord, right? So um, <clears throat> here's, here's what happens. They, they stone him, right? They stone him. And Saul, it says, consents to his being stoned, right? Okay, and so so they had stoned Stephen, and, and Saul was very pleased with that, right? And here's what the next sentence says. This is Acts chapter 8. He said this, At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so, so he says, after they had stoned Stephen, a great persecution arose. That's the word that the scripture uses, a great persecution of, uh, arose after the death of Stephen. So the persecution started after the death of Stephen. What were they doing? Were they, were they chopping up people into bits and throwing them into Lake Ontario? Is that what they were doing? Were they just executing people uh, willy-nilly and all that? Is that what they were doing? No, we don't have to actually have to guess here because the scripture itself tells us what they were doing. It says this in a sentence later. As for Saul, he made havoc on the church, entering every house dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And so in this, in, 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 the, in the biblical witness, the word persecution is used for arrests, for putting someone in jail. That's what the word persecution is used for in the scripture, right? And in this case, it was a great persecution, right? It was a, it was a widespread great persecution persecution and so he was going into houses dragging off men and women and the idea of the persecution is to scatter the the church he wants to set examples for people so it's not that that he was arresting every single person no he was trying to arrest people that you know he could make an example of you throw them in prison and then everybody else would scatter that's the point so it's it's supposed to have a chilling if that that's what persecution is by the way it's very rare that persecution is applied across the board like peanut butter to everybody. No, what they do is they take uh, people that are that have a lot of standing or they're, they're, they brought, brought attention to themselves or whatever, and they make that an example out of them. And the purpose is to get everyone to fear so that nobody else will do the thing that is, is so offensive to them. In this case, it's preaching Christ. In the case of Canada, it's having church on Sunday as the Lord has commanded. And so somebody on Gab was saying, well, I just think that this is a big uh, story. They just want you to think that they're winning. They think that that they have the power instead of us. And of course, of course, that's the thing. Like, like if 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 people like Paul Carter weren't writing articles downplaying the persecution in Canada, and instead they were opening up their churches, Canada would back down. Canada would say, you know what? We're not gonna we're not gonna arrest every Christian here. But no, people like Paul Carter are providing cover for the Canadian government and saying there's not not even mentioning the arrests. Not even mentioning the arrest, because I think if Paul did mention the arrests, then he would have to admit that it is persecution since the word of God, Paul Carter, with all due respect, I don't care what you have to say. The word of God counts prison and, and arresting people and putting them in jail as persecution, regardless of whether you chop them into bits and throw them into a Lake Ontario or not. So that might be your standard, Paul, right? But I actually don't care what your standard is. The word of God says that arrests are persecution. And the sad part is that Paul himself knows this. And I'm not, this is not just my opinion that he knows this. He knows this. Let me show you how I know. This is, this is the article, the same article where he talks about 
I, I, I kid you not. Let me just scroll down to make sure that I'm not missing this, right? This is the same article where he talks about when they arrest your pastor and chop him into little bits, only then is it persecution. The same article starts off this way. Let me just read this to you. I'm going to read it slowly because I think you'll see the problem here instantly. This is Paul Carter. Around the year A.D. 63, the Apostle Peter wrote a letter to some Christians living in northern Asia Minor who were beginning to experience the first headwinds of social and state persecution at the hands of the Romans. They were not yet being arrested, nor had the practice of their faith been criminalized, but they were facing legitimate discrimination. Thomas R. Schreiner characterizes their various difficulties, saying the only specific suffering noted is discrimination and mistreatment and verbal abuse from former colleagues and friends. The Apostle Peter wrote to stabilize these congregations so as to preserve their active gospel witness in the culture. He wanted them to right-size the challenges they faced, so he asked them, and I'm not going to continue. You can read the rest of this article if you want. But if you notice here, I'm sure you did, that in the example that he's using, that he calls the beginning headwinds of persecution, are people saying mean things about you, and then he says they weren't yet being arrested, acknowledging full well that, of course, if they were being arrested, that would be a lot harder, that would be more uh, intense persecution, and, and, and therefore, you, we can understand that Paul Carter knows that being arrested for having church is persecution. Paul Carter knows this full well and yet pretends he consistently and continues to write articles for the Gospel Coalition pretending that that's not happening because he knows that the, the Word of God, the Scriptures, call arrests, imprisonment, persecution. He knows that all logic dictates that arrests, imprisonment for having church is persecution, and he himself knows because he has written that this is persecution as well. And, and I think that, the, I think that the, the argument that he would make was it's not widespread, right? They're not going around arresting tons of pastors and stuff like that. Therefore, it's not persecution. It's just like these one-off things. I'm not sure that's exactly what he would say, but I'm pretty sure that's what, something that, that he would say. And here's why, though. This is the twisted part about this. You know why it's not widespread? Because we have a gaggle of Paul Carters that are just willingly complying. They don't want to be persecuted. So they're just like, you know what? I won't have church. I'll do what you say. I won't hand out the elements. I won't sing. I'll, I'll only have church for a third of my congregation. Like, 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 th like, it worked on you. They told you to stop preaching Christ. Like, like here, the, you know, the apostles here, they said, they, they said, stop preaching Christ. And they beat them and they sent them on their way. And what does it say? It says they left and they rejoiced. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name. And then the very next verse is, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You see, that's why the persecution continued. They said, okay, I understand you've got your authority and all that kind of stuff, but i got to do what I've got to do. I've got to preach Christ, and so if you're going to beat me, go ahead and beat me. I'm glad for it, and I'm going to continue to do what I've got to do. That's what the apostles said, so the persecution intensified. But what Paul Carter did is, oh, um, you don't want me to have church for all my congregation? Okay. And then the persecution stopped because it worked. And so this is the, this is the perverse thing about this. In his opinion, persecution isn't real because he's capitulated to it. He said, okay, master, I will do what you say. In fact, if you want me to write an article to show to everybody how great you are and how uh, you're not persecuting anybody, and my, my, my Christian brothers over here who are being arrested don't even exist, sure, I'll do that too. You see what I'm saying? So, like, this is perverse. This is perverse. This would be like if, if Peter got beaten by the, the authorities here, and then he said, okay, you don't want me to preach Christ? Okay, I won't preach Christ. And then other people continued preaching Christ, and they were getting beaten and stuff like that. And Paul, I'm sorry, and then Peter wrote an article in the, uh, in the Gospel Coalition Jerusalem and said, there's no persecution. I mean, this is just an inconvenience. I mean, sure, you know, I can't preach Christ anymore publicly, but, you know, i, I got to figure out my ways. You know, i got Zoom calls. Like, like, if Peter did that, you'd be like, are you insane, Peter? You, the only reason you're not experiencing it is because you're di disobeying. You're, you're, you capitulated to it. And that's what Paul Carter has done. Paul Carter says, well, it's not persecution because all you got to do is comply and you're totally fine. 
I feel for my brothers and sisters in Canada. You know, I, I've been sending books to people in Canada, and you know, the shipping to get it up there is is a lot more, and so I don't end up really making anything on some of these books. But I'm glad to do it because I feel I feel so bad for the people in Canada that this is this is the majority of their leadership, guys. This is the majority of their leadership. This brother Tim is being arrested for having church on Sunday. And they're trying to make an example of Tim, and, and they, they're making a successful example of Tim because Paul over here is pretending it's not happening. Well, all you got to do is listen to them. Stop preaching Christ on Sunday the way you were commanded to all your congregation and you know, all that stuff, and you'll be fine. And he's saying that that's not persecution because when you, it's, it's not persecution if you comply with it and then they stop. I mean, it's, just, it's absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. But I feel for brothers like this because the reason why they're able to make an example of Tim it's because cowards like Paul, and I'm sorry, this is, he's a public coward. You know what I mean? This is, he's doing this publicly, are, are, are giving lots of people cover to just not meet for church on Sunday. And that's a real problem. Because if every Canadian church opened today and did what they had to do today, this would stop. This would stop. They would not have the guts to arrest every Christian pastor in Canada. This would stop. And so it's just a real perverse situation. And I'm going to relate this to the SBC stuff. Um, the SBC stuff that's happening this week. John Harris gabbed here. He said, when Democratic Party dirty tricks show up at the Southern Baptist Convention, you know that unless those behind them receive a rousing defeat, the leadership of the convention cannot be considered operating by Christian standards any longer. And in case you're wondering what I'm referring to, the way Mike Stone is being treated right now is what I expect from Democrats going after a Republican presidential candidate, not people who call themselves Christian. Now, I don't know about the interworkings of what's going on here. I don't really know a whole lot about Mike Stone. I care about the SBC, but but it's just not my it's not my primary lane, right? I love my Southern Baptist brothers. It's not my primary lane, so I don't devote a ton of time thinking about it or looking into it and stuff like that. So I don't know about the election. I know that I would never I would never vote for Al Mohler, not a chance. But I do talk to Southern Baptists and uh, I've talked to some Southern Baptists recently, and I've just noticed this mindset of being unwilling to fight, unwilling to, 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 to go to blows over serious things. Like you'll, you'll sit through a presentation on critical theory, and you'll identify every area where it's so bad, it's so brutal. It's like, it's like it, it overturns Christian unity. It overturns the gospel. It, 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 it counts Christ's blood as no effect. Like there's so many perverse teachings of it. But then they'll say all that, and they got all the right answers there, and they'll see the Democratic Party tricks show up. They see that Russell Moore's little uh, leak letter thing is just a scam. It's just a, a political, mo- politically motivated scam. They see all the dangers, but they're like, well, but I just want to get along. I don't want, it's not, it's not, it, like, I, I don't think that it's, it's worth it to fight it. I, I just, I just don't, uh, unity is most important. It's like, yeah, unity is important, of course, but unity over truth. If the critical theory stuff that you claim to be so against is such a big deal, then you need to act because it's a threat to the unity of the church you claim to want to have unity with. You have to fight. Fighting, unity requires fighting a lot of the time. It just simply does. And I just... There's just, there's just this mindset of just a, a, a complacency. Just I, I refuse to fight as if that's a positive thing. I refuse to, 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 to come across too harsh as if that's a positive thing when, the, when the, the unity of the church of God is at stake. That's not the position that Paul took. That's not the position that Jesus took. We, it, it's, it's necessary. If, if you love your neighbor, it is necessary to fight sometimes necessary and what i get is it, with all this all these dirty tricks you know my uh, what, what i think is likely to happen in the sbc again i uh, this is a very unstudied unlearned opinion i think probably um the, the 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 democratic side of this you know the side that's using the dirty tricks the side that's leaking letters fakely the side that's calling everyone and their mother a racist they're going to end up winning they're going to end up winning, and it'll either be through their own candidate or it'll be through Al Mohler, because Al Mohler's the king of this, right? He'll write the scathing rebuke of critical theory all while he employs critical theory. And, you know, by the way, I'm just I'm just going to treat Al Mohler the way he told me he wanted to be treated. He said, look at who I platform. Well, you, you platform a bunch of people who are very influenced by critical theory. Obviously so. 
That, so, so you can say what you want all day long. And I like that standard, by the way, Al. I think that's actually an appropriate standard because, as James says, show me your faith by your work. So you say you have faith that critical theory is, uh, is, is dangerous to the gospel, yet you employ critical theorists at your school. All right, well, you've shown me your faith by your works. You're full of hot air. It's just that simple. And so I, um, I, I just hope that this, this attitude of, of not being willing to fight for things that you claim to think are important just dies a very unceremonious death, an unceremonious death. That's why I, I, I just don't think that, that Paul Carter is going to be effective for his congregation as he pretends that there's no fight coming, there's no persecution coming because I've complied with everything and they've been totally fine to me. It's like, like that, that's, that's not the kind of leadership that we need right now. That's not the kind of leadership that we need right now. Paul Carter doesn't have your back. He does. If you're in Canada and you're opening your church because you think that's what the Lord says, Paul Carter and Gospel Coalition doesn't have your back. And that's, that's sad, but you have to acknowledge it and move forward because who cares if they have your back or not? Christ has your back. And so you need to do what you need to do, and you need to fight over the things that you need to fight for, knowing that he who is with you is greater than those who are against you. I hope you found this video helpful. God bless.